God has told you, O oh mortals, what is good, what is right, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Many of you will recognize these words as the words of Micah 6, 8. In fact, some of you probably have much of that Bible verse memorized. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. The scripture readings this morning are variations of the same theme. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell in God's holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly, who do what is right, and speak truth from the heart. The prophet and the psalmist say these words with an understanding that they are tied to the law, the covenant that the people have with God. The law dictates how it is that they are to live as a community of people. The rules are to encourage relationship with God and with each other. When living life based on an ethic coming from their relationship with God, the expression of God's love shown in the world is one of light and wisdom, truth and fruitfulness. The prophet continues, continue to stress, it is a life that always and forever remembers and takes care of orphans and widows. In middle school, I remember watching a docudrama series that I believed was produced by PBS. It was a story of a family whose father had been killed, and the widow and the children were forced into manufacturing work in order to survive. The story was a historical fiction based on the lives of women who had moved to places like New York City in the second half of the 1800s to work in factories sweatshops. The film illustrated the conditions of the time, and they were horrifying. The factory where this woman worked was poorly lit, filthy, full of dust and dangerous fumes. This woman and her two children, along with other women and children, children as young as five, were working in a fabric mill. In the washing and dyeing of the wool, their skin would be burnt by caustic chemicals. In the carding machine, fingers and hands would get lost. In the weaving and rolling process, people were squished to death. Often children, as they were tiny enough to fly through the machine and untangle the threads while the machine was running. They would work at this for 14 to 16 hours at a time. And at the end of the day, very little money went home in their pockets. I seem to remember that the women who brought their children to work, to work, were given an extra few cents a day for the work they did. The women were poor. They had little to eat, and they lived in tenements, sharing beds. Their wages were not enough to live on. And I just remember how wrong it all seemed. Oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on God's hill? Those who walk blamelessly, those who do right, and those who speak truth from the heart. In seminary, I vividly remember a story told in our contextual ministry and social justice class. A classmate who at the time was in her late 30s talked about being a pink collar worker. The term pink collar worker was coined in the 1970s <coughs> to re refer to people working in jobs historically considered women's work. The jobs included nursing and teaching, secretarial work, waitressing, and childcare. These fields at the time were typically female dominated and employees were claimed significantly less than white or blue collar jobs. The pay from one job was not enough for rent, food, and all of one's necessities. The women were working poor. My classmate confessed that in her role as secretary, there was an <coughs> expectation of how it was that she was to dress for the job. A dress suit and patent leather pumps, both not in her budget. One of her regular activities and the network of women in similar circumstances in the city 
was to watch when the stores threw out their old stock. Word would get around, and the women would go to the Zeller's dumpster and dumpster dive on that day to find unbought shoes that were thrown out, trying to find matching leather pumps that were only that were not scored on the side to make them unusable. And I just remember how wrong that seemed. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is Labor Day weekend. Labor Day began as a movement of the labor unions who advocated for an eight-hour day. Eight hours of work, eight hours of recreation, and eight hours of sleep. The movement had lots of prophets and songwriters whose words matched those of the prophets and the psalmists that we hear in Scripture. The thrust was that a community of people working and advocating together, life could be better for everyone. Striving for employment justice was a way to be a neighbor, ensuring safe work sites, providing benefits, and offering fair wages to men and women. It worked, and it didn't work. This morning, we are confronted with the words of the prophet and the psalmist. O oh Lord, who can abide in your tent? Who can dwell on God's hill? Those who walk blamelessly, those who do right, those who speak the truth from the heart. These words are spoken into our marking of Labor Day, calling us to pay attention to how our relationship with God is to affect our attitudes towards labor justice, how we approach work, and for whom and with whom do we advocate. Despite Labor Day, and the work of the unions, everything is not well. There is a section of the labor force who fill permanent need, but are denied full-time jobs. Universities no longer hire tenured professors, rather offering one-course sessions for a person to teach. Establishments are hiring part-time workers and then have them working more than full-time. Banks are getting rid of mid-office and forcing more on the already stressed out front line. Companies are downsizing and cutting out people just a few years before retirement. Businesses are outsourcing, subcontracting, and using employment and temp agencies. For workers, this means no benefits, no pension plans, long hours or few hours, precarious positions, constant stress of layoff notices or knowing if you will work tomorrow. There's a reluctance to report unsafe conditions. Working more than one job to, meet, to make ends meet is common, and working just to work, without a purpose, meaningless, with no loyalty. There's an expectation that in all things, we live as first fruits of God's creation. <coughs> When we hold jobs, offer jobs, and support workers, we are to do so from a heart that is liberated by God's grace to be neighbor. In real life, living as a first fruit is about abundance and care. This translates into generosity when we tip restaurant servers, hotel room cleaners, or tour guides. It influences how we treat and pay those who shovel our walkways, who clean our apartments, who tend to us for personal care needs. It reminds us to speak kindly with those who telemarket, to be patient with those who are customer service reps, less demanding of flight attendants, and more understanding with cashiers. Liberated by God's grace to be neighbor, also means advocating for a living wage. Yes, by this I mean writing letters to our government representatives, asking questions about a living wage during elections and public forums, and participating in advocacy with groups like Living Wage Canada. The living wage movement is one that has the health and the well-being of the whole community in mind. 
The idea is that families can earn the money needed to adequately cover low housing, local housing rentals, food costs, necessities, and have a little left over for emergencies. The movement calls private and public sector employees to pay wages, employers to pay wages to employees, including those contracted that are sufficient to live on. The living wage is to bring families out of poverty, to increase well-being, and offer a basic level of economic security. It is a singular vision that gives us a way to live God's covenant, to be neighbor. It is a picture of the kingdom of God. On this Labor Day, God speaks to us. God has told us, O oh mortals, what is good. And what does God require of us? To do justice, to love kindness, 